Good afternoon. How are you? We've got you after lunch, so I hope you uh, uh, give us all your attention. We might have to stand up and do a little stretching a little later on, but I think uh, you're going to enjoy the program so much you're not going to want to miss anything. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. My name is Dawn Paul George, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure of being the executive director of the Macula Vision Research Foundation. And uh, I want to welcome all of you to today's presentations. Uh, we, you're going to learn a lot today. You're going to learn about us. You're going to learn about AMD and the disease. You're going to learn about how to live better, better quality of life with it, and um, you're going to hear some inspirational stories. Does that sound like a good couple of hours? Good. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, the state of Alabama for being so beautiful and for delivering these amazingly beautiful days, because we are located right outside of Philadelphia, so it's not that warm there right now. So thank you all of you for bringing, having this weather for us. So the lay of the land is you're going to hear from a couple of experts, and then we have a panel discussion, which is why these chairs are up here. And our goal is to make today interactive. You're here because you have questions, right? You're here because you want to learn something. We're going to show a quick video, tell you, tell you our story, and then we'll get on with the presentations. Thank you. Macular degeneration is slowly robbing the sight of 15 million Americans. By the year 2020, this number is expected to be more than 20 million people. But we see a clearer future. We know a cure is on the horizon. Over the past 20 years, MVRF has given more than $21 million to the top scientists conducting the most credible and promising research around the world. For decades, macular degeneration was a mystery, something that happened to people as a part of aging. Now, because of MVRF-funded research, scientists know the nature of AMD. They are pioneering leading-edge genetic discoveries, plumbing the very depths of this devastating disease. Our work is fueling even more discoveries. Through gene therapy, we are now reversing childhood blindness and continue to make headway in advanced treatment methods for wet and dry AMD. We see macular degeneration going the way of polio and smallpox, a relic of the past, a footnote of history. We believe we're closing in. We're working every day so millions of people can keep their precious vision. It's the reason our founders, the Lottman family, started MVRF, where 100% of every dollar donated goes directly to research in the field. That's a vision we can get used to. That's a world we can believe in. Because believing is seeing. MVRF is a 501c3 public charity, and we rely on support from believers like you. Thank you. There you go. A little bit about us. You have to bear with us a little bit. It's a little tricky up here, and I have about three-inch heels on, <laughs> and there's a few cords around, so we're going to take it nice and uh, slow. Right, Nikki? And also to our presenters, be careful. Okay. So uh, we're going to get started with uh, Dr. David Neely. And Dr. Neely is a three-year ophthalmology resident at University of Alabama in Birmingham. He's originally from Huntsville, so he's, uh, he knows Alabama. Um, and when uh, I first spoke to Dr. Neely, because uh, we come in contact with a lot of, of uh, retina doctors, of course, and I said, so I always ask them, why the eye, right? Why vision? Why the retina? And here's what he said to me. Because what's powerful to me is the ability to give vision to people who had it at one time, but lost that gift. And it's incredibly life-changing. How about that? I agree with that. 
Uh, he's also a two-year surgery retina, a two-year surgery retina fellowship that starts in July of this year at UAB and Retina Consultants in Birmingham. So David's got a lot to say, and I think you're going to uh, learn a lot from him. So let's get him up here. Thanks, David. I just want to welcome everyone to uh, uh, this meeting we have today. I think it's a great uh, time for you all to learn, and I'm uh, just real excited to be able to present a little bit about AMD. AMD holds a very special place in my heart because my grandmother is actually affected with the disease, and it's very encouraging to see that the advances that we're having in the future in order to treat this blinding disease. First, we're going to talk about uh, kind of the overview of what we're going to talk about is uh, what is AMD, kind of the terminology? A lot of times you're probably in the doctor's office and uh, they use a lot of words that you're just kind of unsure what they truly mean. Um, and we'll just discuss a little bit of the terminology, nothing too uh, in depth, just so you can kind of understand your retina surgeon a little bit better next time in, in the clinic. We're also gonna talk about who gets AMD, the demographics of it. Uh, something that's very important is why do we get uh, AMD? We'll discuss some of the risk factors and things that um, you and your family members need to be aware of uh, when you're uh, concerned about progression or development of AMD. And then finally, we'll talk about so what? what? What can we do about AMD? What are some of the current treatments, both for the dry form and the wet form? And what's some of the new research uh, that is on the horizon that uh, will enable us to treat this disease a little bit better? So first, what? Uh, this is a very detailed slide, and it's probably kind of how you feel when you're in your retina surgeon's office and they start talking of all these words. They talk about drusen, uh, neovascular, AMD, dry AMD, atrophic changes, things of that nature. Kind of the gist of this slide is that AMD is an accumulation of abnormal, pro or abnormal lipids in the retina and around the retina that can cause the dry form of AMD, and the wet form of AMD where blood vessels grow into the retina and cause decreased vision. When we're looking at your eyes as retina physicians, this is kind of what we're seeing. This center part here is the macula. Uh, that's the center part of the retina that's typically affected by AMD. Unfortunately, that's also where your central vision, your good uh, visual acuity for fine focus work is as well. So that's the, uh, the blinding nature of the disease. The retina is supplied by the choroid, which has the blood vessels that bring the nutrients and take the uh, metabolic waste products away. And this choroid and the retina is separated by the retinal pigment epithelium. These are some of the words you've probably heard your retina uh, doctors talk about. And the importance of that is that with AMD, you have these abnormal deposits. You can see these white spaces here that collect around the retinal pigment epithelium. When that happens, you can have scarring of the retinal pigment epithelium that can cause uh, problems with the retina, which will lead to decreased vision. That can eventually progress to something called wet AMD, where you have elevation and fluid. You can have hemorrhage and exudates. And up note, if you experience that in one eye, there's a 5 to 8 percent chance that you'll find it in the fellow eye. But if the retinal pigment epithelium with all the fatty deposits is damaged enough, this choroid that supplies uh, the retina with blood supply can actually grow abnormal blood vessels into the retina and cause swelling and bleeding into the retina. When that happens, you get what is called wet AMD. And if it is allowed to bleed progressively, it can cause scarring and decreased vision that's difficult to treat. So you can kind of see the two different processes of dry AMD and wet AMD, and we'll talk about the risk factors for both and the treatment um, for both here soon. So who gets AMD? So currently about 8 million people develop intermediate AMD, and 1.3 million uh, people develop advanced AMD. 30% of people over the age of 80 years old will develop AMD, so it's a very high prevalence. And of those, about 90% have dry AMD, and 10% have wet AMD. Caucasians are more likely to have medium or large drusen, so more uh, advanced forms of the dry AMD. 
they're more likely to have abnormal pigment spots in their macula, which uh, helps the ophthalmologist and the retina surgeon know that you are at an increased risk of developing AMD, and they're more likely to have advanced AMD. African Americans, fortunately, have less disease in the central zone of the macula. Sometimes they'll have peripheral changes that want to affect their center vision, um, so they're at a, um, a less of a risk of visual loss uh, from AMD. When we see someone in the clinic, kind of our typical patient that we think out with AMD is an older Caucasian with a central scotoma. That just means a central blind spot. That has a history of hypertension um, and high blood cholesterol and a history of smoking. When a patient presents like this to me, AMD is at the top of my list of things that could be affecting this person. So now that we kind of know a little bit about what dry AMD is, what white AMD is, who gets the disease, kind of one of the big questions is why do they get this? So risk factors for AMD, first and foremost, is aging. It's known as age-related macular degeneration. It's seen in older people. Smoking, that's a very high risk factor, uh, current smokers and former smokers. Cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, female gender, and we'll talk about that uh, here briefly, high blood cholesterol, obesity, hyperopia, that means that you are farsighted, meaning that your eye is a little bit smaller than a normal person's eye, a family history, light irides, meaning that you have blue or light green colored eyes or at an increased risk for AMD, some environmental factors as well, radiation, excessive sunlight exposure is thought to increase your risk for AMD. We'll discuss some of the genetics, which is a big hot topic in, in the current research, as well as some inflammatory issues that your primary care provider um, uh, can manage with uh, appropriate lab values. And then subretinal jusinoid deposits, another uh, type of jerusin that's uh, new research is being done on its risk um, of AMD progression. So talking about genetics, kind of a hot topic in the literature, here is an exhaustive list of all the different genetic and biochemical pathways associated with AMD. I do not expect you all to learn about these, and nor will we talk about them. But the most important thing that I want to touch upon is that their age and smoking history adjusted odds ratio for a history of AMD. If you have a sibling with AMD, you're at an increased risk of developing AMD and having progression of AMD, even more so in a parent. So it's important when you talk with your ophthalmologist and your retina surgeon uh, that you know whether or not your family member, whether your sibling or your parent had a history of AMD. Or if you have a parent or a sibling with a family history of AMD, it's important that you have routine eye exams to make sure that you don't uh, develop the disease as well. A thing I want to touch real briefly on the risk factors, you've noticed that many of these risk factors are not modifiable. You can't change them. You can't change what color your eyes are. You can't change uh, who your parents were, things of that nature. But uh, three important uh, risk factors that are modifiable that can help prevent you from getting this blindness, blinding disease and having it progress are smoking, obesity, and hypertension. It's very important for smoking cessation with people with AMD or an increased risk of uh, uh, having AMD. Um, weight loss, uh, appropriate diet can also help. We'll discuss about uh, supplementation here in, in one second. And then high blood pressure. Management of this actually helps uh, prevent the uh, onset and progression of AMD. It's very important to have just routine uh, uh, clinical visits with your primary care physician and, and your PCP and your ophthalmologist can work together in order to help uh, this blind disease from a multifaceted approach. So what? We've learned about uh, what is AMD. We've learned about uh, the type of people that uh, have AMD, some of the risk factors about AMD. Uh, what can we do about AMD? So we'll talk about now the current treatments and the current research. 
With the current treatments, we'll talk about dry AMD. And right now, the best uh, treatment for dry AMD that we have are vitamins. And we'll discuss some of the trials about the vitamins so you know uh, more about the, uh, the vitamins that your doctor is prescribing for you. And then we'll discuss about the injections for the wet form of AMD. So the two important trials uh, for dry AMD about supplementation with vitamins are the AREDS-1 and the AREDS-2. A little bit of background information about the AREDS-1, it found that uh, to reduce the risk of progression of AMD, a vitamin composed of vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, zinc oxide, and cupric oxide help prevent the progression of intermediate AMD to more severe forms of dry AMD and the progression to wet AMD where abnormal blood vessels grow into the retina and cause dramatic decrease in vision. Researchers didn't stop just with uh, the AREDS-1. They wanted to know, is there anything they could do to make the uh, vitamin supplementation better? With AREDS-2, the two big questions were, was adding lutein and zeaxanthin and fatty acids, would that decrease AMD as well? And then what effects of limiting beta carotene and reducing zinc oxide uh, would have on the progression of AMD? So these new results looked at adding lutein and zeaxanthin, as well as DHA and EPA, the fatty acids, and they eliminated beta carotene. They showed that lutein and zeaxanthin, uh, or the fatty acids, had no additional effect on the risk of advanced AMD, but it did note a slight reduction in the risk of uh, advanced AMD uh, with adding lutein and zeaxanthin without the beta carotene, uh, than just with the beta carotene alone, which showed somewhat of an improved effect with the lutein and zeaxanthin. Interestingly, they also saw that former smokers who took the AREDS formula, the AREDS-1 formula with beta carotene, had a higher incidence of lung cancer. Once again, another important reason, if you are taking an AREDS-1 uh, formula, it's important to let your physician know uh, whether you have a history of current smoking or past smoking as you might get an increased risk of lung cancer if you're taking the beta carotene supplementation. With the AREDS-2, we'll talk about here in a second, they got rid of the beta carotene, which limits that risk. They also showed that lower zinc oxide doses didn't really significantly affect the risk of advanced AMD. There tend to be more protection uh, with it from advanced AMD with higher zinc oxide doses. And so in conclusion with the AREDS-2 and what probably most people with dry AMD are on now is a new formula with vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc oxide, cupric oxide, and now added lutein and zeaxanthin. And also no beta carotene, secondary to that risk of increased lung cancer in people with smoking history. There are many types of vitamins. Um, including eye caps, Occuvite, Preservision. It's mainly uh, to the patient what their uh, preference is, and all the vitamins, if they have the AREDS-2 formula, should be uh, beneficial for the, preventing the progression of intermediate AMD to more serious forms. And just some more food for thought. Um, foods high in lutein and zeaxanthin, which shows somewhat of a uh, prevention of uh, or increase in progression of AMD are parsley, spinach, kale, and egg yolk. These won't necessarily uh, benefit your vision to a, a large part, but they won't hurt in any uh, stretch of the imagination. So it might be good to supplement your diet with these if the vitamins are something you can't afford. Before we talk about treatment for wet AMD, um, I want to mention just in brief the vascular endothelial growth factor known as VEGF. You might have heard this in the office and not um, uh, by one of the physicians and not understand what this factor is. You can think of it as a substance secreted in the eye that causes abnormal blood vessels to grow. This is what we're treating with all of our intravitreal or inside the eye uh, injections in order to decrease this molecule, its effectiveness 
This molecule, once inside the eye, will cause leaking from the blood vessels that causes decreased vision as well as bleeding from the vessels, which causes scarring. So all of our injections today are uh, targeted to limit this molecule's effectiveness. This is a picture of an OCT, which we use to monitor uh, how well our injections are working. You can see it's very cystic, looking like a honeycomb, and this means that there's uh, high levels of VEGF in this eye and causing swelling of the retina, leaking, and could lead to abnormal blood vessel growth and scarring. With our injections, our goal is to cause it, uh, all the edema and all the leaking to dry up, and from that, usually we have better visual outcomes as a result. In the past, we didn't have these drugs. You might have uh, talked with some of uh, your friends who uh, were treated for AMD prior to the invent of these drugs we'll talk about. And really, the only way in the past we could treat this was using laser therapy. The thought process was is that you would give up a little bit of vision wherever the laser spot scarred in the leaking blood vessel in order to prevent it from uh, leaking further and scarring in more of your vision. Unfortunately, you can see with laser spots, they're very close to the center part of vision, and you can note that that could cause substantial decrease in vision. So it really wasn't an ideal treatment, but for the longest time, that's all that we had available to us. Sometimes if you fail other treatment uh, modalities that we'll talk about in uh, next, uh, your doctor will uh, try intravitreal corticosteroids. It's an older form of treatment, and it does a fairly good job at uh, reducing the fluid within the retina. However, it has uh, side effects that are high, and those include elevated intraocular pressure, which could lead to glaucoma and needing further surgeries, as well as cataract progression. People might, a lot of times in clinic, people ask us whether, since they have age-related macular degeneration and cataracts, is it beneficial or not beneficial to get cataract surgery. To date, there's been no study that shows cataract surgery worsens age-related macular degeneration. Um, the uh, limiting step is how well your vision is from your retina damage. Cataract surgery might not uh, make your vision better because the age-related macular degeneration caused significant problems to your retina, but the cataract surgery in itself will not make the age-related macular degeneration worse. So cataract surgery is recommended for those with age-related macular degeneration in most cases. Talking about intravitreal medications, uh, you might have heard of the term macugen, Lucentis, Avastin, and Ilea. In clinical practice, most retina physicians are using Avastin and Ilea. Uh, Avastin is a drug that was initially used to treat colorectal cancer. Um, but was found to inhibit the abnormal blood vessel and leaking in the eye as well. Ilea is a newer drug that is thought to work a little bit longer than Avastin and that acts in a slightly different mechanism. Usually in clinical practice, we'll try Avastin first because it's a cheaper drug, and if it doesn't work sufficiently, then we'll switch to Ilea or to Lacentis. How to follow patients? Uh, most people usually will start off with uh, three injections a month spaced apart. And then once all the fluid is reabsorbed, there's two schools of thought. The first is a treat and extend, and the second is a treat as needed or treat PRN. Usually, once all the fluid is reabsorbed, we'll see the patient back instead of a month apart, six weeks apart, and do an injection at that time. If there's still no fluid, we'll see them back a little bit longer at eight weeks. We'll always use maintenance injections, though, to help prevent the accumulation of fluid once again. Sometimes we can get people to once a year injections as well. If the fluid reabsorbs uh, any time uh, during this increased interval, we go back to a shorter interval. The treat PRN method is another method that's used quite a bit. That's where you treat until all the fluid is gone, and then you treat once fluid reaccumulates. The two difference between these is that the first one, the treat and extend, has a maintenance injection, and the treat PRN uh, is only treated whenever you see injections. So these are two different techniques that your retina surgeon may employ to help treat your AMD. 
the economic burden. I only mention this because uh, uh, to give you all hope, knowing that there is a high economic burden uh, with AMD, and therefore there's a lot of research going on uh, in, in order to improve the disease. It's estimated that the annual loss of GDP in wet AMD is 5.396 billion, and in dry AMD, roughly 24 billion. So as a result, lots of current research in order to treat this blinding disease. Many trials are going on. Many trial, new trials are focused on the dry form of the disease to help prevent it rather than just using vitamins only. There's also new uh, modalities with uh, injections, different drugs in order to increase its infective, effectiveness. And also I want to highlight topical drops. Most people um, would be uh, very happy instead of getting an injection in the eye just to having topical drops instead. It would decrease the risk of infection and things of that nature. And so lots of things on the horizon in order to help improve vision. In closing, I want to leave you with this picture, uh, which I think is probably the most important picture of this whole slide deck. This is a picture of an AMSR grid. Um, we usually give this to people with a dry form of age-related macular degeneration. You can note that in the center here, the lines are distorted. This means that there's abnormal blood vessels that are swelling and bleeding into the eye. If you see this, then that means that you need treatment promptly with an injection in the eye to prevent scarring. Very important that you see your retina physician soon because if it stays too long, scarring will happen and there's very limited uh, treatment for scarring. We can talk about it more in the question and answer session and, uh, and afterwards about how to use the AMSR grid. Um, it's very easy, but I just want you all to just kind of commit this to memory. If you note this in either eye, um, that sign that active disease is going on and that you need prompt treatment by your retina surgeon. Thank you all very much for your time, and I look forward to the questions. Good job. Thank you. So, next on our agenda, we have probably a very familiar name and familiar face uh, because uh, Montgomery, Alabama is this gentleman's stomping grounds. And I'm sure that some of, uh, some of you recognize him. Uh, Dr. Joe Fontenot is the Medical Director of Community Services for Vision Rehab also known as CV, CSVR. He's had that practice for 15 years. Joe is a cardiologist, which I think is an incredible switch in career. And as some of you may know, Joe himself has low vision. Uh, he's also a certified low vision specialist, and you changed uh, careers in that at what age? Oh, 50. Age 50. Is that inspiring or what? Um, Joe's had many, many speaking engagements all over the world, uh, all over the country, and is very well renowned in his field in terms of low vision. And he's here to talk with all of you and, and uh, help you learn a few things about that part of your, uh, your life and how you can uh, manage uh, what you have to do every day uh, better and, and how you can cope with that. Take it away, Joe. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dawn, for that introduction, and thank all of you for coming this afternoon. And I think it's very important that people who have macular degeneration learn all there is to know about it and learn how to cope with it. And uh, I think we have another speaker after me who's going to go over that in a little bit more uh, detail. Now, uh, I am the medical director for an organization called Community Services for Vision Rehabilitation. Myself and Dr. Sherry Gloss, and that's Dr. Gloss, who is an opt optometrist who works uh, with me. And uh, we're a nonprofit 501c3 organization. And our mission is to provide accessible, compassionate, comprehensive, multidisciplinary, affordable, that means that we try and do as much as we can 
to help people who have vision loss. Our office in Montgomery, where we are every other Thursday, uh, is on North McGee Road, 3054 North McGee Road, and we do have a local uh, phone number. But anyway, the title of my talk is You Can Do Anything You Want. Now, that means that people who have vision loss, particularly people who have central vision loss, like 99% of the people with macular degeneration have, they can do the things that they want to do, the things they feel they need to do. Uh, they have to have certain things. They have to have motivation. They have to have the right tools. And, and they have to, to be able to get training, people to show them uh, what to do. They, they have to know what their goals are. Uh, they have to have capable, certain minimal capabilities. But then with the right tools and training, they can almost always accomplish whatever they want to. Now, how many people here actually have total blindness? I don't see anybody raise their hand. Yeah. And if you do raise your hand for whatever reason, wave it a lot, because I don't see too well myself. But uh, anyway, so we're talking about people like yourself, most of you who have impaired vision, which interferes with the things that you want to do, uh, be able to, you want to do around your house, you want to accomplish, whether you want to keep working, you want to do your hobbies. But, but so what are we talking about? We're talking about people who do not have normal vision, uh, people who have vision loss. Now vision loss can be of any degree, and, and it varies from very mild to very extremely severe or even totally blind. It's very rare for people who have macular degeneration to go totally blind. How many of you here have had your ophthalmologist tell you that? How many did not have an ophthalmologist tell you that? A few, yeah. But it's extremely rare. And Dr. Neely, you correct me if I say anything wrong. Uh, and, uh, but your vision loss does tend with macular degeneration to slowly progress. Now the shots definitely do help, and, and you all should be receiving those shots if the ophthalmologist has recommended them. But it varies, the vision loss varies from moderate to severe. And moderate vision loss, 2070 to 2160, there are a lot of people out there driving cars who have that degree of vision loss. In Alabama, the li limit is 2060. You're supposed to have 2060 or better but many people continue to drive beyond that limit. They shouldn't, but they do. But when you get into the more severe degrees of vision loss, those people are not driving and they're not able to read. So uh, there are different types of vision loss. Again, with macular degeneration, you most likely have the central type. You, know, you don't have the peripheral loss. You get that from glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa, various other diseases and you usually do not have the generalized haziness or fuzziness that people uh, get. But generalized, you have this sort of generalized haziness. You, this is 2060, and you can see the letters at the bottom of that chart are pretty fuzzy. And as it gets worse, things get more and more hazy and fuzzy, and gradually you get to a position where, if I can get it to move, uh, things are just one big blur. And of course then, but with most, most people with macular degeneration get central vision loss. And there you have a blind spot in the center. And I'm sure that most of you who have vision loss from macular have this sort of a fuzzy gray blind spot in the center. And a lot of people don't even notice this, particularly if it's only in one eye, until it's pretty advanced because your brain tends to fill in that blind spot. It doesn't like having a blind spot there so it does what's called perceptual completion, which means it'll fill it in. And even looking at that slide, you can see it looks like there's a continuation of that tree trunk going down the middle of that blind spot. I don't know if any of y'all can see that, but if you have that central blind spot, it really screws up your ability to read, for instance, because if you look directly at a word, you won't see the entire word. You, you won't see what's in the center. This slide shows a person with macular degeneration looking at the word cat, 
and the blind spot takes out the A. So they see the C and the T. One of the things that the op op occupational therapist who works with us does is try and redirect, teach people how to redirect their gaze in a different direction, and then they can sometimes see better. It's called visual skills or PRL training. And uh, mm -hmm. anyway, and then there's peripheral vision loss. And with peripheral vision loss, uh, which again you get from glaucoma, certain other problems like that, you develop so-called tunnel vision. Now that's a different problem, and it's actually a little harder to work with people because magnification doesn't work quite as well. So if you magnify, it might just throw the enlarged image outside of that little central spot where they see. So what happens to people who don't see well? Well, they have all kinds of problems. They can't read, they can't drive a car, they can't recognize faces, and a lot of you are familiar with that, and they can't do a lot of other routine activities, whatever their routine activities are, which leads to a lot of people become depressed, they become isolated, they lose their independence, they begin to have falls, accidents, they have hallucinations and panic attacks, and eventually an increase in mortality. Everybody who loses vision as an adult goes through a grieving process. Just like they had lost a child, a spouse, and that's, that's normal. It lasts sometimes for months, but uh, it's, it's, you've lost something like you've lost an arm or a leg or whatever. Uh, people usually work their way through that not all of them do. A lot of them become depressed. So depression is at least three times as common in people who have vision loss. And a lot of them remain depressed. The depression has its own bad side effects. It prevents them from accessing help, care, from trying to get out there and learn how to do things. Uh, so that's, that's the problem. There's a particular type of hallucination that people who have vision loss get. Uh, it's called Charles Bonnet Syndrome. How many of you here have actually heard of Charles Bonnet Syndrome? Please raise your hand and wave it. Fair number. Okay. How many of you actually see things that are not there? Okay. And that's a, at least 20 to 30 percent of people who have macular degeneration will think they see something and it's not there. Very commonly, it's people, just a face that you don't recognize. Uh, sometimes it's dogs, cats. Women very commonly see flowers. Uh, men rarely see flowers. I had one man once who did see a flower, and I asked him what was his job. He was a florist, so I don't, I don't know why we got the lights back on. But if you could t dim them again, that would, no, the ones here, these right here, if you could turn those off. But anyway, uh, that's called Charles Bonnet syndrome, and it's normal. It doesn't mean you're going crazy. Now, if you see things and you hear them talking, that's a different thing, and you need to see a different kind of doctor besides the ophthalmologist. But, but so, so what do we actually do in our office? We do what's called vision rehabilitation, and we have a low vision clinic, and we evaluate people. Well, first we talk to them and ask them, various questions, and, and get an idea what they're having trouble with, what they want to do, uh, that sort of thing. We do not use a standard e-chart. Uh, even blind people know that there's an E there, so if they put a blind person in front of a chart, they'll say they see an E. Uh, we use a different kind of chart, which has more letters up top, and enables us to divide people more accurately into different degrees of vision loss. We do a lot of other tests to see how these people are functioning. We do a time reading test uh, using sentences of equal uh, length and complexity but decreasing size. We do what's called contrast sensitivity. So people who have macular degeneration all have some contrast sensitivity loss. That means you have trouble seeing things that are faint and you need more contrast, you need more light, uh, we do a, what's called a Fletcher central field test. So we have them focus on the black spot in the center. We flash a little laser light around and we can see if they have a blind spot and if so, uh, where it is. So why do all these tests? Because different things work for different people. 
Most people, when they develop vision loss, they go to the corner drugstore, to the Walmart, they buy a magnifier, and it doesn't work for them. And they've spent their money, so they then give up. So what we try and do is see what the person's vision is like, what their goals are, what their capabilities are, and then we can figure out what they need to be able to accomplish those goals. So if you have moderate vision loss, most people with that will do better with improved lighting, sometimes simply high plus glasses, handheld magnifiers, various things like that. If you have more severe vision loss, you might need stronger magnifiers, maybe some electronic magnifiers. And, and we and the other uh, vendors have a, a, a tables outside where you can look at those kind of things. And uh, then if you have very profound vision loss, you might need more audio devices, more electronic magnification. People with even severe, even total vision loss can still use a computer, but they have to use certain computer modifications, sometimes special software. And if you're blind or near blind, you need more, again, of those sort of things. You might even need white tip cane or guide dogs, that sort of thing. That's rare with macular degeneration. And uh, we try and let people know right off the bat what's available that's either free or cheap. There are a lot of things available. How many of y'all use or know of the Talking Books program? All right, quite a few. And that's a, a very good thing. And there are other things like that available. There's free telephone information services, uh, religious material. Tell me if I'm close. Yes, five. <laughs> five, okay. And we have a program to give things to people who have no income. And we will see anybody with or without uh, uh, insurance. A lot of things we do are very simple. Just improve lighting, uh, teaching people how to use contrast, a lot of large devices, large calculator here, large print checks, which every bank has available and no bank has ever volunteered to a patient. Uh, different glasses, optic glasses, uh, all kind of various magnifiers. Again, you need to get the right thing. That's the main thing, and that's what we try and help people do. And all sorts of devices that connect to computers. Uh, again, we have this sort of device out there. It's very cheap. Uh, computer enlargement. Uh, white tip canes, Braille is still helpful with some people. And nowadays, smartphones and, uh, and tablets are very, very helpful to a lot of people. Uh, there's all kind of apps out there, some for magnification, some that are, quote, screen readers. Training is available with occupational therapists, rehabilitation teachers. Cost is always a problem for these devices. We try and stock things that are cheap. We have uh, high plus glasses that cost $10 and a lot of very inexpensive things. The bottom line is that a lot of things can be done to help people who have vision loss. The most important thing is to enable them to be able to help themselves, to not be as dependent upon the people around them, their family, their caregivers, to be more independent and functional. How many people in the United States receive any form of low vision care? It's a very small uh, number. And this slide shows less than 20 percent, and I think that's true here in Alabama today. Most people, unlike you out here today, most people do not know what's available. They have no idea. A lot of them, as I say, go to the Walmart, they buy a magnifier, they go home, it doesn't work, and they give up at that point. So that's what we're trying to avoid here today. We're trying to make people aware of what is available. So. Again, you here in the audience are ahead in the game. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, I guess we'll have questions, suggestions later. Yeah, after the panel session. Okay, well, thank you so much. All right, that was great, huh? I'll tell you what, I couldn't agree more with everything that Joe said, and uh, Macula Vision, us at Macula Vision Research Foundation and our partners, Eyesight Foundation of Alabama and International Retina Research Foundation, we all concur that low vision 
uh, information and support. Getting that out to all of you, pe people who need it, is a top priority. So you saw that those numbers were really low, 20%. That's astounding, Joe. Uh, but that's exactly why we do these support site programs. That is our goal because you have to have access to those resources, you have to have a better understanding of what's out there. And uh, I just want to mention too, we've got Optelec. Uh, many of you probably stopped at their table. They're a strategic partner of ours and they have all those tools, a lot of tools that Joe mentioned as well. There's no pressure to buy or anything, it's just there for you to, to demo and touch and feel and kind of try, because that's the only way you know, right? And we're really not trying to mess with your lighting. We, we're, that is not purposeful. We understand how important lighting is to low vision. So I think we're just... We're trying to get the best it could be. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, but you're good sports, right? Okay, good. So the next, uh, and I just want to kind of tie a couple things together before I and, uh, introduce our next wonderful speaker. So again, the goal of this program is to start kind of at the top, which is the research and the clinical aspects of the disease, okay? And then move down the spectrum to what Joe just spoke about so wonderfully, about now I've got the disease, now what do I do? What's out there for me? Life doesn't have to stop. Okay, there's a lot of stuff out there, and it will continue to be. More and more products and more and more assistive technology. It's there for you. And now we're going to move to another part of the spectrum over here, which is how to cope with the disease. How to, when, with your, you know, we always say macular degeneration or AMD doesn't just affect the person. It affects the family the caregivers, the loved ones, people all around you. So what Dr. Dreer is going to talk about is just that, okay? Uh, Dr. Laura Dreer is, the, at the, is with the Department of Ophthalmology at UAP. She's an associate professor, and what makes her a little different is that she's a clinical psychologist, okay? She runs support groups, she helps people cope with this complex emotional issues that go along with the disease. And uh, also what, what, what happens as your AMD progresses, because for most of you, it changes. I mean, that's what our body's about. Your body changes every day, and so does the disease most likely. So how do you cope with that? And also, for many older people particularly, there's a lot, there are other health related things going on in your life. So sometimes you have a, quite a full plate, right? So she's going to talk about that. So without further ado, Dr. Laura Dreer. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dawn, and I uh, really appreciate being here today to talk with y'all. And I said, I just said y'all, I'm from Birmingham, Michigan originally. Ended up in Birmingham, Alabama, and now I say y'all. <laughs> so, I've been down here since about 2003, and I really love that I'm able to come here today and share with you some things about um, how to cope better with vision loss and other chronic diseases that sometimes go along with aging and sometimes pop up um, as we go through life. And I'm also honored to work in, in daily capacity with folks adapting to vision loss and their family members too, who are really um, a pat on your back for all of you guys for being here and wanting to learn more about this. And I'm excited because this is my passion. Everybody teases me, you're a clinical psychologist in the Department of Ophthalmology. And it's cool because it's really a multi, as Joe mentioned, and even David Neely mentioned, one of our awesome residents that has come and helped us with our support groups in further educating and helping people adjust and knowing there's hope. Don't have to live with depression. You're gonna get through this. Um, we'll hold your hand next to you and we'll walk you through this process. So I'm delighted. I'm gonna get, just jump right on in here. I wanna thank some of our partners here, especially the Eyesight Foundation Alabama, International Retina Research Foundation, right here in our state that have really helped us with our projects, our research, as well as support groups, so thank you. 
AMD, I'm not going to go into too much because I know Dr. Neely did a great job with this. You never know who's in front of you presenting. I want to make sure we got this covered and I know a lot of you know about how it does impact you on a daily basis and it can affect your central vision, which has important implications in family members. It's hard sometimes to understand that too, we found in our support groups and our research, um, how, why that person can't read, why that person has to ask for help in a restaurant going out for dinner, why that person might want to stay at home, feels a little sad and has a hard time asking for help. So we also talked a little bit about some of the risk factors too, and I'm gonna, I raise this because it's an important area we're actually putting in a grant to look at a wellness, a lifestyle intervention to help try and uh, target some of these areas, smoking, obesity, and those are things that really do get impacted. And a lot of you know, I know in treating a lot of patients that it can affect your eating habits, for example. It's hard to see cutting an onion. Uh, it's easier to get McDonald's. <laughs> Buy food out instead of preparing it for yourself. It's hard to get out and exercise. You're afraid sometimes you might fall and, and, and things like that. Or transportation, you gave up driving. So those are some important areas, though, that also have implications for other chronic diseases. So we want to keep you healthy, even in light of the vision loss. And it also spills over onto your mood, which we're going to get into. The treatments, I'm going to kind of skip over this because Dr. Neely did an excellent job going through some of the medical treatments that you get for injections and other things with age-related macular degeneration. And as many of you know, and that's probably why you're here, you want to hear the latest advances. There's no treatment right yet, but we are working very hard and behind the scenes with the research to get those treatments. In the meantime, to adjust and adapt, as Dr. Fontenot mentioned, Low Vision Rehab is an excellent resource for our patients and our family members. How to do some of those simple strategies that you might not have thought of or not knowing that they're out there and how to appropriately fit a magnifier to your vision. It's important because we see a lot of patients that come in, they sometimes give up, but it, they just didn't go through the low vision rehab process and got uh, um, devices or different strategies that can help them adjust and adapt. That's great, but what about the emotional aspects? So we're great at treating a medical condition, finding low vision rehab to adapt, and a lot of you may have been to occupational therapists, learning how to do different things, but let me ask you a show of hands. How many of you as consumers or patients, how many of you had a hard time adjusting or difficulty with this whole process. I get some, I know, <laughs> okay. Let me throw this, because you probably don't get this in talks. How many of you are family caregivers or family members here today? Okay, show of hands. Have you had a hard time adjusting, providing care? I'm seeing some nodding. Exactly, and that kind of goes across a lot of different kind of health conditions that we work with people on. One of the things, when you're first given that diagnosis, it's it can be tough and it's hard to accept and adjust. And it's okay to feel a lot of different stages of grief. Many of you have probably heard of that, different stages. Um, denial, shock, this can't be me. Maybe they diagnosed it wrong, I'll get a second opinion. And some of those are normal reactions. And I will share with you that a lot of people, the majority, cope and adjust just fine, which is the great news. But there's some, there's a subset that have, I'm seeing some shaking heads too, um, that have a hard time adjusting emotionally. And there's no, I wish I had a, a wand to predict, you know, in four weeks you're gonna be fine. You know, you might be depressed now, but you're gonna be okay. That's not really how it works, and it can kind of wax and wane. And uh, some of those things that we see, uh, you know, where it might have a hard time adjusting it becomes more of a problem as it goes on with time and if there's not treatment, and it can develop into clinical depression. So when we first see folks, when they get, tend to get the diagnosis, it could be AMD, it could be a lot of diabetic retinopathy, other conditions, it's a shock. You had these expectations in your life, and now there's this condition that's gonna impact it. Um, but the good news is that even though it does affect and develop into depression sometimes in some, there are effective treatments out there. 
a lot of you, if I asked you, do you, do you think depression is a normal part of aging? Do you see a show of hands? Okay, good. <laughs> That's one or two. It's not, and there's treatment out there that can help, and it's, I'm going to go through and walk with you through that because some of you may have never been to a psychologist, and some of you and your doctors may think there's the stigma around that, and they, they feel uncomfortable to have that conversation. So, and that's my grandparents. I always work in my family into my slides at some point. So some common concerns facing people with AMD and other disabilities. These are important things I want to share, especially with the family members too, and other, there may be some providers here. Worry about future health problems. And some of you may have had these thoughts in your head and, or do right now. Frustate, frustration with uh, the limitations. And that can, we sometimes get folks with a stroke. Um, they have cognitive issues on top of the sensory loss. Um, employment, it could be fear about having to move out, transition to assisted living or other um, placements, living back with your kids, God forbid. <laughs> um, when am I gonna potentially have to give up driving? That's a huge one and important for family members to know that a lot of times people in our research we find that they get they become more isolated which can lead to depression and it's important for you to get them out there do things keep keep people engaged in the community um, worry about caregivers a lot of times I'll see folks having a hard time adjusting and they're worried about their family member who had to rearrange work or give up working and their schedules and how do we um, we work with both of them actually a family unit to try and get them to um, adjust and maximize quality of life. Relationships, um, dealing with complex medication regimes, finances, you know, a lot of these are um, concerns that are, are brought up to us. How many of you, did a lot of these sound familiar? Show of hands? Okay. Signs of depression. A lot of people will ask me, this one's a hard to read, but I'm gonna kind of give you one of the things to keep in mind, especially for family members and others, if you're thinking, do I have this depression or is it an adjustment process? As I mentioned, not to worry, a lot of times you kind of figure it out as you go and you get resources, you talk to your doctors hopefully. Um, if you're worried about, is this something more than that? Some of the things are if you're feeling depressed more than two weeks or so or more, you feel that loss of interest or doing things that you used to enjoy previously, you have a change in sleep, maybe your appetite, um, Suicidal thoughts. We get some folks that want to harm themselves. Um, get fatigue, um, problems with concentration, sleeping too much, too little. These are some things to keep in mind, um, feeling hopeless. Um, for family members, as well as doctors, as well as yourselves, just in terms of asking for help. And we're gonna go into that in just a moment. Some factors that can complicate that if it is depression, um, other medical problems, um, some prior history of solving life problems, um, a neurological problem on top of it. Where you live, are there resources, access to care and treatment? And these are some issues or problems that can exacerbate the way somebody copes and adjusts to vision loss or other disabilities. I'm gonna just kind of skip over this because I want to get a little bit more into some of the specific ways to, that we do that we engage our patients in in terms of treating depression, so that uh, you understand a little bit more that there is help out there and what resource, resources are available. But just to give you a general idea, this is a slide that I'm talking about public health and in disabilities. It is a big chronic health problem, and it's gonna grow as we get the baby boomers. And the aging population, the more and more numbers that are coming through. And the CDC, Center for Disease Control, has um, generated approximately about 55 million people report living, in a, um, living with some type of long-lasting disability or chronic health condition. That's a lot. And caregiving in general, too, is a high, high number as well. In this slide up here, it's hard to read, but what it demonstrates or illustrates is that over time you're going to see more and more chronic health conditions and um, the older you get. And so that's something to pay attention to. Dawn kind of touched on that, where a lot of you, you may have age-related macular degeneration, but also diabetic diabetes. Um, you may have some other heart problems, 
you're also trying to manage that as well. So these are things that can really um, complicate that adjustment process. I also want to highlight for you family members and you caregivers, um, we've worked a lot with, had a grant previously with um, the Roslyn Carter Caregiving Institute. And there's a, a big effort too, and, and, um, and it's unfortunately uh, lacked or, or looking at adjustment of family members too, which I mentioned previously. When you cope with a, any type of medical condition, it doesn't really happen in isolation. It happens as a family or with your friends or neighbors. Um, so a lot of you are providing important care and it's costing a lot of money. A lot of folks are putting in 20 or more hours of care and you're not getting reimbursed for it. You're sometimes losing jobs. And it's important for your family members to take care of yourself as well because if you don't keep yourself in check, we found in our research, especially with folks with low vision, it compromises the care you provide, which compromises their adjustment. And that can affect folks and lead to institutionalization, um, relationship problems, and a whole host of other things. So it's important when they get, folks get to me, if it's for depression or adjustment problems, we try and focus on the whole family um, as much as possible, depending on the condition. Let me switch gears a little bit. I wanna tell you guys and share with you a little bit about what we call behavioral health interventions with folks with AMD, other retinal dis eye diseases, and, um, and share with you what that's like. And I call it behavioral health because mental health, unfortunately there's that stigma, but, and we gotta break through that more and more. Um, it's okay to ask for help, and it's, if you have a mental health problem, which you know we can call depression, anxiety, other things, there are effective treatments. And it, that's the thing that, where I told you in the beginning, my passion is trying to share that and, and raise that awareness that it's okay to ask for help, it's okay to get help, and there's a lot of different ways we do that. So let me share a little bit more with you about that process. Behavioral health or mental health kind of understands the mechanisms that enhance patient, family, or caregiver awareness, their knowledge, and actual coping strategies related to a particular health condition. It's very broad. We have techniques we've tried in clinical trials, it's scientifically driven, that can enhance health outcomes. It can improve your quality of life. Um, so that's the part where I want to share with you, there's hope. And you don't, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm gonna keep reiterating this, but you don't have to live with depression, it's not normal. So one of the goals that we try to do, when we work across, there's a, a grant I have that um, is looking at improving glaucoma medication adherence, using your eye drops more frequently. So we, even like health behaviors to depression and quality of life, um, they focus on a host of different interventions. You may have heard, and some of you have, cognitive behavioral therapies. Those are the most, they have the strongest support of evidence. And I'm gonna tell you about what that's like. Um, there's health promotion programs, which are great. They raise a knowledge and awareness. But for if it's something more like clinical depression, you wanna go beyond raising knowledge and awareness. You wanna build and enhance a skill set so that you can take yourself and try and challenge negative thinking that we, a lot of folks can get into, um, which can pull them down. So, what behavioral health or mental health treatments are not? This is a, you can't see this, it's a traditionally probably what many of you thought, a therapist talking to a patient on a couch. That's not what it is. And this person, it looks like the therapist, he can't even read the reactions of the patient in the right. Um, it's not sitting on a couch and just venting about your childhood. Uh, just to correct, it's behavioral health treatments are short term. They're very focused. So when I have a patient come to me, they're referred for depression or a family member, the adjustment process to help them along is short term. A lot of times they're, it's not a year long and that's one of the things we address in that first session. It's very active. We might talk for about an hour. Um, we look at some of the ways that uh, you've been problem solving through uh, what you're going through. It's very active, may have you engaged in some homework assignments to challenge some of that negative thinking, or maybe a lot of times with AMD, it might be asking for help or doing different things. I always give the weight loss analogy because a lot of us try to lose weight <laughs> over time. 
And therapy is sort of like that. If you've never been to psychotherapy or behavioral health treatment, you know, at first, you might, when you start wanting to lose weight, you work out, you change your diet. Same thing with mental health. You got to do something different. And we work with you through that. And it might, just like working out, it might hurt at first. You might feel kind of, oh, this, why am I doing this? It can't be good, even though I'm hearing it is. And we try and encourage you, get past that hurdle, and you start doing things. We build on that success, and you start feeling better. You start noticing, just like with weight loss, you lose, your clothes fit looser, you start to feel a little bit better. The same thing with behavioral mental health treatment. That's why one of the things that I really just, again, it sounds sim simple, and it, but it's a process, and it can be short-term, and it may or may not involve family members. And the same thing goes for family members as well. You guys are thrown into this role without any training. <laughs> you get like five minutes if you're lucky with, no offense, Dr. Neal, <laughs> with your ophthalmologist. You know, you, you guys are busy Six. seeing patients. Yeah. Six minutes. Six minutes. That's great. Um, so this is a little bit longer and, and allows you to ask more questions and get the treatment you need. Again, some of the different formats, individual therapy, family therapy, group-based therapy. Sometimes we do classes or support groups, which I'll kind of highlight. And I'm gonna skip some of these because I want to just touch on the, the main things as we wrap up. Um, we do a lot, typically in the office, we'll have people come in, but we know with vision, that's a barrier for a lot of you driving and getting there and getting family members off work to get you there. So we're moving more and more towards telehealth. Um, and we found that in our clinical research too. It's effective. Community settings too, we're trying to reach out more to churches and, and get you engaged. There's a lot of different ways too that you can support a, a person who may or may not have depression. Um, that person may feel helpless and wonder what to do. It's important for you to learn to recognize the symptoms. If you're the person thinking you might be depressed or the family member trying to, to work with that person. Explore resources, encourage treat, treatment, uh, for people to get treatment if you feel they are um, suffering from depression. That person may feel ashamed. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, unfortunately there's that stigma around depression, but try and, and normalize it. Try to have that conversation with them. I get this question asked a lot, and you can definitely catch me. I'm gonna stay here for a while afterwards so we can talk more about this, but some of these ways to start a conversation, and family members ask me this all the time, or doctors in our ophthalmology department. Some things that you can ask, I've been feeling concerned about you lately. Um, recently, I've noticed some differences in you and wondered how you're doing. Um, I've wanted to check in with you because you seem pretty down lately. Questions you can ask, when, okay. when did you begin feeling like this? Did something happen that made you feel, start feeling this way? How can I best support you right now? Have you thought about getting help? These are some, I know they sound very basic, it might be hard to have these conversations, but there's ways that we can help you talk through this. In normalizing it, you're not alone in this, I'm here for you. Um, I may not be able to understand you, how you feel, but I care about you, I wanna help you. Um, tell me what I can do to help you right now. We work with our doctors, residents too, in, in training them how to answer, ask some of these questions. Things to avoid to say, and maybe some of you have heard this unfortunately, it's all in your head or snap out of it. You're gonna get through this just fine. Rarely we know that depression resolves without formal treatment. So that's something to, definitely important to consider. If someone also has a hard time going to treatment, suggest a general workup with a physician or offer to help go to that first session with that person um, and encourage them to make a list of symptoms. So I'm gonna kinda end here just because, well, actually I'm gonna skip one. one more. Like I mentioned too, some of our research focus, we're focused on helping people adjust to vision loss and um, supporting them to improve their health outcomes. Another great value, valuable resource again is support groups too, which we run UAB Connections. And it's a great tool because you learn to meet others and hear stories, you're not alone in this. And we do things, education like this on a monthly basis along with um, social or recreational outings to keep you engaged and the family members too. So I'm gonna answer more questions about that when we um, wrap up. And that's it. Thank you.
Tripping into the light. We heard Dr. Dreer talk about some of the psychosocial issues related to losing your vision. Well, I'm here to tell you that the next presenter knows what that's like. He's a living, breathing example of how, to live, how living through life, all the ups and downs created by low vision, uh, how they happen to a person, and uh, what impact they have on your life and your family. His name is Charlie Collins. He wrote this book. We have this book for sale if you want. It's no pressure to buy. We just want you to know it's available. And Charlie wrote this out of his own personal experience. Um, I met Charlie a couple years ago, and he's probably sick of me saying this, but he changed my life. Um, you're going to hear and understand why I say that when, when he's finished. Um, he is an international inspirational speaker. He is he, he's, uh, he's in sales at Optelec. He is a uh, entrepreneur and a business owner, and uh, he has an amazing story to tell. And I'm going to let all of you know that you made the right choice to be here as opposed to somewhere else today because I'm sure many of your friends and family would have loved to hear what he has to say, and you can tell them about it. It's a story to tell. So Charlie, um, and the one thing you might know, not know about Charlie, you probably figured it out, but Charlie can't see. So are you coming this way? Yeah. All right. There's no cords out here either. Here's Charlie Collins, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Before I start, I just wanted to thank MVRF for putting this together. Nikki, Dawn, and Lynn work so hard from Philadelphia to put these types of programs on all over the country. And I've been lucky enough to travel with them many times, and I have many stories. <laughs> so I was unable to see, if you guys don't mind, uh, whether you have wet, dry, any type of low vision, would you mind raising your hands really high for me? Good, that means we're not alone. Did you know the number one thing that limits a blind person is their vision? <laughs> Did you know the number one thing that limits a sighted person is their vision? And where there is no vision, people perish. This talk, my talk, is all about successful living with low vision. It's all about how to maximize your vision. Are you guys with me? Yes. All right. I got to rely on audio more than seeing. I do want to say I thought Lynn was going to be sitting in the front row because she's worried about me walking back and forth on this stage. <laughs> Lynn, you were going to catch me. Have you all heard of J. Paul Getty uh, from Getty Petroleum? Well, he, had, he was interviewed for, uh, he was a big success in life, so he was interviewed. And he had three keys, three keys to success. Number one, you gotta get up early every day. Number two, you gotta work hard. Number three, you gotta find oil. So today we're talking about low vision. It's not quite that easy. We're talking about overcoming and focusing on what we can do. Helen Keller said, the most pathetic person in the world is someone who has sight but has no vision. See, we don't see with our eyes. We see with our brains. And with a healthy brain, the mind's eye can do amazing things for us. It's keeping me on this stage. After two years of me being in and out of doctor's offices, 
trying to figure out what was going on, why was I struggling, why was reading becoming a challenge, why was I slowing down in school. We were finally sat down. We went up to Mass Ioneer and we spent two days in the office getting tests. The we is, I have four sisters, one brother. That's six kids and my parents, all eight of us, jumped in the big green Plymouth with wood paneling. The, the, the car that had the back seat facing the cars behind you, they don't make those anymore. Anyway, after two grueling days of testing, we were sat down and told that four out of the six children had juvenile macular degeneration. I was one of those lucky ones at age nine. So for the next two years, well, maybe not quite, but a year and a half, we went back and forth as a family and we kept getting testing and testing and testing. <clears throat> and what we found out was that we definitely had a form of macular degeneration. My little sister was five and my brother and sister were wearing glasses and struggling. Well, they sat us down finally on our last visit and they told us, we thank you for your services, but there's nothing we can do. There's no pair of glasses, no magic pill. There's nothing that we can do as doctors to help these kids along their journey with macular degeneration. It's kind of the same today, except with the dry form. They did hand us a piece of paper that told us, hey, don't ski, don't play sports, don't, 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 what we couldn't do in life, and handed it to my mother after they reviewed it with us. We walked out of that office, I, I, the door didn't close, and my mother crumpled that piece of paper up and threw it out. It's very important for any caregivers or people working with people with low vision is not to enable them. Enabling somebody with low vision is no good. It doesn't help the person. Well, picture this. You're 13 years old. Come on, you can get there. It's a couple years back for some of us. And you go into school that day. And as you walk down the hallway, you notice that the faces coming at you are very difficult to see. You see all the movement, but the faces, I just, the details, not there. Walk into the classroom, sit down in the front row, the teacher's writing on the chalkboard. You can hear the writing, you can see writing up there, but the print just can't be made out. Then the teacher says, turn to page 65, we're gonna read. That's when the heart drops, that lump inside, uh-oh. Please don't ever ask me to read. Please don't even come near me and read. Then we off to gym class that day and we're all in a line and the captains, the two people are picking the teams and it's dodgeball. <laughs> dodgeball is not a fun sport for low vision. And I got picked last, I think, that day in class. So my self-esteem was getting knocked over and over. The fear was increasing. That uncertainty of the rest of my life, that who am I, what am I gonna be able to do was setting in deeply. I go home that day, I walk in the house and I see my mom, my mom, how was school today? Fine. See, I didn't understand. I'm not gonna tell you how I'm feeling. You're my mother anyway. Anyway, she says, hey, you got a nice big piece of mail. Why don't you go open it? So I do. I go over and I open this piece of mail. It's a big lumpy mail, like has gifts in it. And I rip it open and I dump it all out and I pull out this big piece of paper and it's pretty large print because I could see it. And it said, Charles J. Collins, you have been declared legally blind by the state of Connecticut. That is not a piece of mail I want to receive at age 13. I'm sure it's not a piece of mail anybody wants to receive. I did get a free fishing license <laughs> and some other garbage I couldn't see. 
but I was grateful. I'm grateful today that I wasn't diagnosed uh, or declared illegally blind. <laughs> if you read my book, you'll see that came later in life. <laughs> so anyway, you know what happens when, for me, it was I started focusing on what I couldn't do. I started thinking about not driving, ever, legally, of course, in my life. I started thinking about what I couldn't do, how I couldn't see, and I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. And I started feeling very disconnected. Now, granted, I had a brother and two sisters with low vision, so home was a piece of cake. But when I was out in the school with my friends, I felt alone. Nobody could relate. And talk about, I heard about depression and all this. You know what Ralph Waldo Emerson says? And this is the truth. You be, we, we become what we think about all day long. What do you think the number one cause of blindness is? I can't hear. Diabetes? Okay. The actual number one cause of blindness is thinking. There's plenty of blind-sighted people out there. Thinking causes blindness because you don't see with your eyes, so how could a disease cause it? And it was true in my case for many, many years. For 10 straight years, I focused on the problem. Well, one day, and when you focus on the problem, it only gets harder and harder and harder to do life. And you know what else happens when you do that? is that your brain will go into atrophy and it will go to rest, it will go to sleep. Those pathways of reading and engaging it and challenging it will no longer work. And guess what? We become comfortable suffering. Our new comfort zone becomes com uh, suffering, which is truly just a familiar zone for the brain. And stepping outside, that is the goal. Stepping outside that comfort familiar zone and asking for help and doing something about it. So I was at the motorcycle dealership and I used to cut the lawn there every week and I did that for, I bought um, oil and spark plugs and things for my motocross bike because I used to ride a lot of motorcycles. And yeah, I rode them legally blind. So in case you're thinking, obviously I was 13 declared legally blind. Well, you can ride, you can do things in life legally blind. I might do a little over the top, but most people, you can do what you need. You know, you can live life successfully. So anyway, I did it this day, and, and, and it was a beautiful day like today. And I was standing at the line of the motorcycles, and, and I fell into a dream. I could hear the motorcycle's engines, and the wind was blowing, and I kind of didn't see anything around me that was going on. Oh, just a nice place, something I hadn't been to in a long time. Because, see, I only focused on the past and what I wasn't going to be able to do in the future. In the moment, forget it. Didn't even know. Somebody would, if someone said, why don't you try to get in the moment, I don't even know what that means. Well, in that moment, I got tapped on the shoulder by this long, bearded, ZZ Top looking dude. His name was Jimbo. He was the owner. You know what Jimbo asked me? Well, first he asked me a question. Hey, can I talk to you? Do you know what I thought? Oh gosh, he's gonna fire me. I didn't do a good enough job. People who aren't good enough don't do good enough jobs. And I said, yes. Hey, I was wondering if you'd like to work here. What? Why would he ask a legally blind loser if he wants to work at a motorcycle dealership? And how, would he, how did he know that almost every day I dreamt or I thought about maybe being able to work there. But you know why I didn't approach or ask? Because I'm blind. I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough. Nobody wants me. So I wouldn't dare ask him if I could work there. I told him I'd have to think about it. I jumped on my scooter and I rode home. Somebody got it. <laughs> and I, I rode home. And I went in and I said, Mom, yeah, I'm 23 and I'm living with my mommy and daddy still. I had just moved back home. Anyway, I told her. Jimbo asked me if I, if 
I wanted to drop it to mother, and I was so nervous. And she said, that's fantastic. You know so much about motorcycles. Heck, you did it. I said, yeah, but how am I ever going to do that? Well, I went to bed that night, and the same bed I lied for a long, many, many nights, and I cried myself to sleep in that bed. I went to bed many times in that same bed, and I looked up to the God of my misunderstanding, and I asked him to please take me this night. Over, I did that from 13 till that age many times. And you know, I kept waking up in the morning. My work obviously isn't done. This night I slept well. I got up in the morning, I shot back up there and I said to Jimbo, yes, I'll take the job, but I gotta tell you something, Jimbo, I am legally blind. <laughs> Trying to see my watch. I, Dawn's coming nearby. <laughs> But I don't see her, I'll pretend. Um, so anyway, I said, I will, but I gotta tell you, I'm legally blind, uh, I'm nervous. And he said, oh, I know, I knew you had some vision issues going on, but that's okay. You're passionate, you're enthusiastic. And most of all, I believe in you. You will be an asset to this company. Wow, somebody believed in me. I said, I'm gonna need help. Help? I got to ask for help? I'm 23. I shouldn't have to ask for help. Well, I didn't have to. I chose to. And I got the help. I got my first optolect reading machine. One of the things we have out there, of course, it was 100 years old, but it was beautiful because I started reading. I, re I ignited my brain, forming those pathways. I lit it up. I read. I learned how to use a computer with large print magnification in speech. I carried around magnifiers. I had proper lighting, and my life transformed. I then took my... <clears throat> I automatically changed my environment. I painted the walls. I hung large print signs around the store. I put signs on all the motorcycles, and I did all of it to improve my day inside the motorcycle shop, and you know the customers loved it. In three short years, I did so well in this business, I became the vice president and part owner of a multi-million dollar corporation. <laughs> More minutes. Who's giggling? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. But what happened in that position was I started hiding my eye disease again. I'm not a motorcycle. Well, I, yeah, I am. I accidentally rode everything and did all that, but that's in my book too. Anyway, I started, when I look at you, I eccentrically, my eyes veer off to the side and people will turn their head kind of like I'm rude and I'm looking over their shoulder at someone else, but I'm not. I'm doing my best job to look at you. You know what the number one thing they tell you in sales is? Eye contact. You know what that means for me? That means we're rubbing noses if we're making eye contact. <laughs> and you don't close many sales when you're rubbing noses with another dude <laughs> or his wife. So. I've started feeling alone and different and not good enough and all this stuff came back. I started feeling depressed and ah, I got out of there. But I started another company. Why not? Well, you think I'm going to go work for someone? Then you got to get there and listen, you know. I thought, hey, you know what our life, we got to design our lives around our, don't ever use this word, but disability. Remember, if you think you got one, you got one. But you don't. You have the ability to do anything. Differently, of course, but you can. Somebody out there on the way in said, oh, all I want to do is read. I've already made the decision. I need the right things in my home so I can successfully read and do what I got to do. I don't need to go in to listen to the rest of this thing. I mean, I can relate to that. You're in the right place. Anyway, I started a company that it was a big retail environment and it was all low vision adaptive tools. Whether it was a signature guide to a talking scale, to a screen reading device, to a desktop, to, but everything and anything I could think of, I put all in this one location, and then I started marketing it. That was in 1997, and we won major awards. I employed many blind people, and we helped transform the lives of 15,000 people in the state of Connecticut alone. We also worked with the v uh, veterans around the country. So I sold that company recently because my path now is I have a new campaign out there. 
And this campaign, you know what's up, Doc? Mine is called Wake Up, Doc. <laughs> no offense to the ones in here are awake, but most are asleep. And I am so, was so sick and tired of you walking in my store, crying, regaining that independence by reading again, and telling me that for the past two years, you wish you knew to come to my place. And, I, and you know why they didn't know? Their doctor wouldn't tell them. So it's wake up, doc. And that's why I travel around the country. Optelect and Freedom Scientific allow me to come and do these things and speak my experience with overcoming adversity and living a better quality of life. Isn't that what we want? You all have, hey, you're here until you're not. Let's make the best of it. Let's serve others. So, and if you want to tell me a story about why you can't do something to low vision, I become deaf very quick. That story isn't what we want. Am I making sense? Yes. All right. You guys are with me? Yes. All right. I have time to do my thing. I, you want me to take that? Nah, I think I can. You can. Yeah. Will you be Vanna? Yeah, I'll be. All right. She's a good Vanna. All right, so what we're going to do, an exercise to close out my talk. And you don't have to get up or anything. I want you all to fold your hands like you're saying a prayer or whatever that is for you. If you can't see, please help the person next to you. All right, you got it? Everyone doing it? All right, now look down and just remember which thumb is on top and separate your hands. Thanks to you. All right, all right, now I want everybody to do me a favor. Please, if your left thumb was on top, raise your hand. All right, guess what? You guys are the better thinkers in the room. <laughs> now, I want the people that had their right thumb on top, please raise your hand. You guys are the sexier ones in here. <laughs> now I need you to, anyone had their thumbs side by side? Raise your hand. A couple of them. Couple all right, you guys think you're sexy. That's what the research says. <laughs> now, I want you to go ahead and shift your fingers so your other thumb is on top. Do this, but switch your thumbs. Switch your fingers. Do it again. If your left thumb's on top, move your hand up and then put them together. How does that feel? Lopsided. Lopsided. Yucky. All right, now pull them apart and go back to the old way. How's that feel? All right, welcome to your comfort zone. Welcome to a habit. So, maybe getting low vision, it's time to start shifting the fingers and doing something different. Because if you did that for the next 28 days, a couple times a day, it would become your new habit and your new comfort zone. You could, and if you want to be sexy, just shift and put the right thumb on top. <laughs> it's all good. Now, I did this presentation yesterday and I did the thumb thing. And I didn't, I forgot to tell them all one little thing that I'm going to tell you guys. There is no research. I made it up, but they all went home thinking, damn, I wish I was sexy. Thank you. Great job. Great job, Charlie. See why we love him so much? And all of you are so lucky you got to see him, meet him. He's going to stick around if you got to get the book, you want him to sign it or you take a picture or whatever. Panel, can we get you up here for a few questions real quick? All right, who's got the first question? Okay. You could probably hear me. For those of us who are genetically inclined to have macular degeneration, <coughs> should we be taking the vitamins now? That's a Dr. Neely, I'd say. A very great question. Um, the vitamins are for people with intermediate AMD to help prevent the progression to more severe forms of dry AMD or the progression of the wet form. It's not uh, necessary for you guys to take the vitamins yet. It's more uh, imperative that you have screening, uh, annual screening in order to uh, catch uh, early development of the disease. And then at that point, uh, the decision will be made to make the, start taking the vitamins or, or not. But uh, for the time being, if you're just genetically predisposed to AMD, no need to take the vitamins as of yet. Thank you. And I think, too, one, and Dr. Neely, you can validate this, but I know some of what we know and our researchers understand is that if your parents were diagnosed, one of your parents or both were diagnosed with 
age-related macular degeneration, the risk of you having it is significantly higher, right? It is, it is significantly higher. The odds ratio of you having it is higher, uh, more so if your parent has it rather than a sibling, but even if a sibling has it, it's, it's a higher risk than just a person without any family history of AMD. So that would go the same with your children. For those of you who have kids and you have age-related macular degeneration, you know, we encourage everybody, talk to your kids, make sure they're seeing an ophthalmologist and tell them that, right, Doc? Let them know that it... Yes, very, very important. And a lot of times the, the children are bringing uh, uh, their uh, family members with AMD and it's something we always try to counsel that they need to come in for a routine screening as well. Yeah, that's good. And early detection is very important. Got another one, Lynn? Yeah, right up here. All right. This is like Price is Right, isn't it? Hey, uh, I've had the uh, cataracts removed, and I do see an ophthalmologist. But with lights are very glaring, and when I see any type of street light, headlight, that's like a sparkler, uh, what can I do to help this problem? Let's have Dr. Neely and then maybe Joe or uh, can Aunt respond. And, and, and uh, Charlie, you can talk about what you do in your life with that. Uh, that's a great question. Um, other ophthalmic or eye problems can cause those issues that you're having. Uh, it's very typical for cataracts to cause those types of issues. I don't know if you've been evaluated or have had cataract surgery in the past. Uh, we talked about it uh, briefly, but cataract surgery hasn't been shown to uh, cause a progression in age-related macular degeneration, so it would be beneficial possibly if you've never had cataract surgery, you get evaluated for that. Some of those symptoms sound like cataracts. You, if you've already had those removed, there's also, sometimes you can have a, a scar tissue form on where the cataract surgery was um, uh, completed, and that's called a posterior capsule pacification, and laser touch-up can be done uh, to help that. Um, if that's already been done, there's uh, just other uh, uh, more specific issues with the implant lens that could be addressed and things of that nature. But it would be good to have uh, just kind of a, a thorough ophthalmic uh, workup, maybe not even by your retinologist, but by a general ophthalmologist or a refractive specialist. Joe, you want to add a couple things? Yeah, it's very common for people at macular degeneration to have problems with glare, some much more than others. And the main thing that you can do uh, is work with filters, in other words, sunglasses. And sometimes simply yellow or amber colored glasses, which some people wear even indoors, will help quite a bit. It's a matter of trial and error. The other thing is, anybody with macular degeneration, and maybe Dr. Neely would agree with me, they should always wear a hat with a brim when they go outside. And they ought to wear, when they use filters or glass, sunglasses, they probably should use the ones that have the side panels and completely cover, not the little small ones that just uh, cover the immediate front of your eyes. So so-called over-the-glasses glasses are also available that you can put on over your prescription glasses. So a lot of things like that. Is that what you have on right now? What you have around your neck? Is that those amber ones? Is that what you use for glare? You have them on right there. That's, oh, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. having your sunglasses on your head. Yeah. Forgot where they were. Charlie, do you want to comment on that? Anything what you that you do with glare? No. He, it doesn't. Bo nothing bothers him. That's the best. Yeah. Well, part. some people, some people have a lot of glare, and other people it doesn't bother them. Yeah. It, it's very, it's variable in people with magic. Right. Okay. Know? Next question. Another one. Um, Dr. Joe. What is the name of your organization, and is it something, is it a, a situation that, uh, it, I know it's not in place of the ophthalmologist, but is it a medical thing that insurance will pay for? I'm not sure I understood. You said does insurance, insurance cover it? Does insurance like, cover low vision? Insurance covers any visit to our office. In, in any kind of low vision rehabilitation facilities, there's a very good one in Birmingham at UAB too. Uh, we've never had a patient uh, whose insurance company turned them down. So your visit to us is covered by insurance. At this point in time, the aids and devices, that is the stronger glasses, the filters we just talked about, magnifiers, those are not covered by insurance. 
Now, as I mentioned in my talk, we do have some things that are very inexpensive, as low as $10. We do have a program for giving things to people who have low income. But some of the other devices are expensive. It's a matter of what you want and what you need. But we're able to get most people with macular degeneration, even very severe, to be able to read at a relatively low okay. cost. Okay, so the answer to the insurance question is yes, right, Joe? Yes. And the devices may be out of pocket, but you know, just stay on top of these issues because these things do change as more and more awareness is out there. And again, getting that number from 20% of people who get low vision rehab higher, right, Joe? That's going to drive some of the changes in the insurance. Okay. His, what's your, real quickly, what's your organization called, Joe? What's the name of it? Oh, Community Services for Vision Rehabilitation. Okay. Or, or CSVR. And we, again, we do have a booth, have a booth out there on the way out. Yeah. yeah, and we'll get you the address too if you don't get it. But they have you have materials, right? Right. Charlie, you want to? I just wanted to say one thing about. I hear a lot about cost and expensive and all that. Is anybody in this room at one time of their life bought and owned a car and paid insurance with gas and all that? <laughs> He's not kidding. Raise your hand, right? Well, I, I, I bought cars but for my wife. But anyway, why I just like to say is that there's a greater cost not to invest in the quality of your life. And it's called depression and loneliness and self-pity and all that. So I just don't like hearing about, oh, it's expensive and all that. It, you know, whatever's in your means, do ask for help, ask your kids, find a program, but be willing to go take that step to do what you need to do to get the products you need in your life. That's a very good point. We've all spent money and wasted money on things that did that were less important, right? Okay, what else, Lynn? We have another one? Okay. All right, this one and one more. Uh, I have color vision problems. Before I was diagnosed with AMD, I, my color vision was almost perfect, but now, I cannot distinguish between black and blue. I mean, it's something simple, I know, but I also have developing cataracts. So is it cataracts or AMD or both? That's for Dr. Neely. Did you understand that? Okay. Um, uh, AMD can affect the cones, which are the, the visual sensing uh, organs of the retina. So it could be a component of the age-related macular degeneration. <coughs> However, cataracts can cause a dimming of vision. and uh, usually, some of our main complaints are problems with glare that we discussed earlier, but also you can have a, a yellowing of the vision, a decrease in color sensitivity as well, so that could be a component as well. There's other uh, eye problems um, not related to cataracts or AMD that can cause decreased color vision as well, um, uh, but given your history of AMD and cataracts, uh, those would be the two most likely uh, reasons why you have decreased uh, vision. Uh, a cataract evaluation might be beneficial for you. Um, it might not help your central visual acuity if your AMD uh, is advanced, uh, but a lot of times people notice a, a good uh, resolution of glare and also uh, they say the colors seem brighter. Um, and that's almost as important to some people uh, as the uh, central acuity as well, because uh, it increases quality of life. So that'd be something great to uh, uh, just to talk with your general ophthalmologist or, or retinologist as well. Okay, one more. Lynn, we have somebody out there? And again, if you have other questions, you can talk with these folks individually after we do the, the raffle prizes. But one more public question. Avastin has been known as a cancer drug. And I noticed on the screen you had something referring to uh, cancer research or something. Is macula tied in with cancer? Uh, Age-related macular degeneration is not tied in with cancer, it's not. Um, the uh, Avastin was initially FDA approved for colorectal cancer, and uh, researchers in uh, Miami, I think, originally noticed it's, it's the reason why it's a cancer drug is it's uh, anti-angiogenic, so it decreases blood vessel growth. In order to survive, the cancer needs lots of blood vessels, so it would kill the cancer that way. They noticed that if they put it inside the eye, that it decreased the abnormal blood vessels in the eye. 
So it was a, um, for a different purpose, but it actually worked very well. And then recently, Mackie, Jen, Lucentis, and now the most recent, Ilea, are other anti-VEGF or anti-abnormal blood vessel uh, medicines that are used to decrease that. But uh, to our knowledge, AMD isn't directly linked with any form of cancer. It's just an added benefit that they found that a cancer drug actually worked very well for treating abnormal blood vessels in the eye. That's a good question. It's a common mis misconception, I think, out there. And also, the, we know from our research, and in fact, one of our scientific advisory board members was involved in the Avastin uh, discovery, if you will, of, of that kind of cross-repurposing the drug. Uh, but I will tell you, too, and you may be reading about this in the news, and we can certainly give you information on it. Go on our website or call us. But there's a lot of buzz about statins and the connection to age-related macular degeneration and statins. And I'm sure many of you take them right now. Um, so be looking for that, because there could be some very interesting connections. You know, one of our presenters yesterday, who's a, a, a researcher that we've funded in the past from University of Alabama, Christine Kershaw, was talking about, you know, the bot is an, a, an amazing thing. And the body does all kinds of things that we don't quite understand yet in order to protect itself, heal itself, bring different, different, uh, what's the term I want, Doc? Uh, mo all molecules to rescue itself. And the eye is very independent as far as our body goes. So it kind of takes care of itself, right? Yes, yes it does. Um... And uh, it is interesting work. It's actually uh, being done up at Mass Eye and Ear. They're, they're trying to uh, uh, do some better work up there and, uh, and discover uh, that statins can, in, uh, they've shown that there's association with it decreasing or increasing the reabsorption of the uh, lipid, the abnormal lipid, the drusen. Um, so prospective studies need to be done on that to see if that uh, is actually an alternative uh, to uh, uh, vitamins and things of that nature for the dry AMD. So it's very exciting research. That's kind it's of promising. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Joe knows this, eye healthy, heart healthy. That's also something you can think about too. There's a big connection. Okay. It's time to get you out of here. We're over time a little bit, but let's thank the panel. They're awesome. Uh, we've got some, all of you are winners in the audience, but we have some special winners for the, uh, the giveaways. Um, Ollie Robinson, is Ollie? There's Ollie in the green. Ollie, you've got a book, Charlie's book. And it's signed, but if you want your picture with him or whatever, you can do that. So good for you. Lucky Ollie. <clears throat> uh, Catherine Wilkowski. Where's Catherine? Hi, Catherine. You also are the winner of, one of Charlie's book, Tripping Into the Light. Okay, and then the last gift is donated, uh, generously donated by our friends at Optilec. It's a compact reader. Take it with you, it lights up, you can read with it. The value is $300. And Dorothy Dot Sparrow. You're a lucky girl! <laughs> Okay, um, before you take off, we've got the, just some closing remarks, and uh, I'd like to introduce my good friend Tori DeKaiser from Eyesight Foundation of Alabama. Thank, thank you, Don. I'll be very brief, because I know y'all are ready to uh, visit with the exhibitors some more, uh, but I want to thank Don and her team and the Macula Vision Research Foundation for bringing this wonderful program today. And um, the one yesterday in Alabama, they did one in Huntsville on uh, Monday, and they're going to Mobile tomorrow. So uh, this is a wonderful partnership with the Eyesight Foundation of Alabama, which I lead, and um, International Retina Research Foundation, and also the Alabama Vision Coalition, which is led by Caroline Clark over here. Um, Shirley Hamilton works with me. and. We are so proud to be involved with this. We are a grant-making organization like MVRF, and how we met uh, was through a meeting held a year and a half ago of all the funders of eye research in the country trying to get together and figure out how we can move eye research forward 
uh, not only for macular, vision, uh, macular de degeneration, but glaucoma and other diseases of the eye. Uh, we know how much suffering goes along with eye disease, and we are determined to get it to stop and put an end to it. And so we thank you uh, for taking advantage of this uh, because we know that until those cures and, and better treatments are available, people like you are still living and coping with eye disease. And um, we are very hopeful and we appreciate you being here. And Dawn, thank you so much.